are research associates at Advice International. And one has worked there as a senior research associate since 2008, performing research and development work on a number of ELISA-based assays and lateral flow rapid tests. He also spends his time managing the ELISA production and working on semi-automation projects to help streamline manufacturing. In his spare time, he usually spends time with his family, playing with kids, and occasionally trying to catch up on some sleep. Um, the other speaker has worked at, as a research associate at InBio since the, uh, October of 2013. She recently graduated with a master's degree in bioengineering from UW with a research thesis on developing an automated HIV um, diagnostic assay for use in low research resource settings. Um, Shivani obtained her BS degree in bioengineering from UCLA in 2011. While at UCLA, she worked as an undergraduate research researcher to study patterns of bacterial adhesion and to develop a drug delivery system against prostate cancer. In her free time, she likes to travel, bake, sing, and spend time with her friends. Please welcome Jane and you and Shivani from So thank you very much for having us here. Uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk. Um, so thank you for the introduction. So again, my name is James Needham. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about my background, my, because I see a lot of students out there, my uh, background is in physics and math, and then I actually did uh, research work after that at NIH on developing HIV diagnostics and lights. After that, I went back for my master's in biomedical engineering. So that's the background I've come from. And since then, I've been at Biology International working in a lot of research projects, a lot of development projects for, uh, for a lot of rapid assays and ELISA. And we'll go into some of the details of what we actually do at Envios, what Envios is, and um, hopefully if you have a question like that, we can uh, go through some of the things that we feel are innovative that we do and want to do. Um, and I'm Shivani Dharmaraja. Uh, my intro is pretty thorough, but I just recently graduated, so I guess I'm new to the working world. Um, but yeah, I a lot of undergraduate research. Um, just graduated, so if you guys have any questions about maybe going to college or post college, I'm probably just sorry, I'd be happy to answer that because that's my most recent experience as a And we are very excited to have Shivani with us as well in Biles. Uh, a lot of the new research work she's been doing at, uh, at UW has been very exciting for us to see. And uh, we'd like to start to incorporate some of that as well. So, just uh, basically an outline, we're just going to cover who we are, what we actually do and then go over the current practice of diagnostics. Why is this important? How do you diagnose someone if they've been sick with a disease? Why is this important and, and how do you do it? And then the actual need for innovation that comes up. So basically, if you want to summarize it quickly, what is currently in this field and then what can, what can be? So it's actually a very, very broad topic and we're only going to go, go over some cursory level um, explanations and some of the basics that we do and this is certainly not covering everything that's out there in the field of diagnostics. Uh, just briefly about InBios International, um, we develop medical diagnostic devices and we typically target third world diseases, so diseases like dengue fever or Chagas or Leishmania, um, visceral Leishmania and cutaneous Leishmania. A lot of these diseases some people in the United States have never heard of, but um, if you're from different countries, uh, even in India, dengue is uh, becoming endemic now. Um, so it's an issue that affects a lot of people, millions of, pe of people worldwide. We were founded in 1996. Uh, we currently employ about 35 people. And uh, we've actually, for the number of people we have, and our number of products is kind of outstanding, I, I want to say. We have uh, several FDA approved kits as well for diagnosing, say, West Nile virus in the United States. Um, uh, v VL I already talked about. Um, also dengue. And we also just recently got USDA license, which was uh, quite, a, quite an undertaking. So basically we're going to talk about um, three main categories for what it currently is and then kind of what we think can be. And hopefully a lot of you students in the future can be the ones contributing to what's going to be in the future. So these are ELISAs and I'll talk just really, really briefly about what that is because some people I'm sure do not really know what that is. Uh, rapid tests, what those are. And I'll cover also reagents which are absolutely critical for what we do, for the work we do. Um, so just to briefly summarize our ELISAs, you know, we look at new detection methods, novel targets, 
The same thing for rapid tests, and Shivani's going to talk a lot more about their rapid tests, what those are, and how they work. Um, and then I'll just briefly touch on the reagents and what we do for this that could be innovative and what we want to do even more so to, uh, to help out for diagnosing people, especially in third world settings. So, you know, I think all of us have a varied background here, but it's important just to have a brief understanding of what happens when we actually get sick. So when a virus comes and you're, there's an invading species in your, in your system, say a virus or a bacteria, your body digests this. There's a nice process that goes through this to present these antigens to specialized cells, which in turn develop these things called antibodies. I'm sure you've all heard of these. But these antibodies are very critical for how we diagnose what we do. So there's different ways of diagnosing. We're just covering serology right now is what it's called. And what we typically look at, I'm not sure if there's a laser pointer here, but we look, people look at viremia, typically with things like PCR. We look at particularly antigen, antigen capture, and also antibody response. So typically in a normal infection, you have maybe an antigen that may be circulating in your, in your system, followed by IgM antibodies that come up, which in, the, in turn call, followed by IgG antibodies, which are longer term antibodies. IgM rises up fast, but then goes down. So there's um, an interesting cycle that happens with uh, pretty much every infection. So just to give some of you a brief idea of what these actually look like, this is what an ELISA kick typically looks like. There's a plastic plate, and these are things that are used in clinics in hospitals where you have a setting with resources, with power, with people, trained technicians. Whereas a rapid test, you can think of things like your pregnancy test, things where you have a line, like a plus or a minus, really, really simple and rudimentary things to do. And Shivani's going to cover more about how, what we do for our rapid tests. So just to give you an idea, this is a, a basic, basic understanding. So I, I feel like it's kind of important to understand just the basics so you know what it means to actually innovate for how you look at, uh, at diagnosing someone, finding out if they have the disease. Once you know if they have that disease, how do you then treat them? So for our ELISA test, just like in this, this plastic well right here, each of these wells has a special antibody. This is just an example. And if you add someone's serum to that, that plate, if there is this red antigen, is how it's colored right now, if that's there from that virus that's captured, we can add a secondary antibody which has a conjugate which will eventually change colors to show a colorimetric response proportional to the amount of antibody or antigen that you're looking for. So the, there are lots of benefits. It's highly, highly sensitive. It's widely used in lots of clinics worldwide. There's an existing infrastructure. The operation time, though, is longer. It's about one and a half to three hours, typically. It does require trained technicians and power supplies um, and, and equipment that can be expensive. The other thing I want to mention, this does have quantitative results, which makes it very nice for actually diagnosing, is this person really infected or not, versus if you're looking at something like a rapid test, typically with existing technologies, most people are looking at these by eye. And then you always hear those jokes, you know, am I pregnant, am I not pregnant, things like that. So you need to be really, uh, really aware of, of what, you, uh, what you can do for diagnosis. So I'm just going to briefly touch on this before we go into the, um, the uh, change that we're doing for rapids. But for innovations with ELISAs, there's a lot of interesting things you can do, but you're also constrained by the existing infrastructure. So this makes it an interesting challenge, in all honesty. It'd be amazing if you could just say, oh, I'll just use the next highest, best fluorescent particle that's out there. Let me get the best sensitivity. But if the infrastructure right now, from where we're coming from, from an industry, trying to sell product, trying to get people to actually use this, they're not going to invest in a $50,000 piece of equipment to actually detect fluorescence or detect whatever is the next novel way of uh, you're going to run your assay. So you have to make sure if you're trying to get this in the clinic at the bedside, you have to be able to deal with the existing infrastructure. It makes it challenging, but it actually makes it kind of interesting because you have those guidelines that you have to work within. Um, however, that does give us alternate detection methods that we can still work with. Um, there are things like chemiluminescence or some fluorescent reagents that are still practical. Um, and the other thing that we can use that apply directly to our ELISA are the quality of our reagents, how you develop these. It can be really, really interesting. And um, I think that's another source for innovation, hopefully, in the future. So ultimately, your goals for ELISAs, you want them faster, more sensitive, and more stable. I'm not going to touch into how we're going to do that right now. Um, but rather, I'm going to talk more about 
our choice for how we decide to do an ELISA or a rapid test, this is based a lot on the disease and where it's located. So your disease and your local environment, they have a huge impact on your overall device design. If it's dengue, like in, in India or if in, in Southeast Asia, you have lots of limited resources where you're trying to deal with an environment where there is no power. So you may want to have things like a rapid test that are very simple. Uh, whereas West Nile, you're dealing with, say, Europe or the United States, you can expect people to have access to a hospital or clinic. So this is, kind of drives our device design. And that brings us actually to our rapid tests for uh, things like dengue and uh, Chagas, which uh, Shivani is going to talk on. Okay, so as James mentioned, there's a lot of great applications and diagnostics out there. Um, but with ELISA's more specifically, you're kind of constrained to areas that have more resources, so clinics that have power, constant elect, uh, water supply, things like that. So what happens in your, if you're in an area that has more limited resources? Um, and you might think that might be more clinics that are in the outside, in other countries, or maybe more third world countries. But this can actually be a case in high income countries like the US or in Europe. Um, for example, you could do at-home monitoring or testing. So examples of this are glucose meters or the pregnancy test, which has really revolutionized um, healthcare at the home level. Um, other things are military field testing and agricultural testing, where you really need something that's applicable in the field to get a proper diagnosis. Um, again, and then in low-income countries, you might have more constraints, such as untrained personnel or unreliable electricity or water supplies, making things like ELISA's less practical to do there. Um, so, in order to have something that can be well implemented in these settings, you need something that can be affordable, equipment free, and easy to use. Um, and then here is an image, actually, of a picture that a coworker took in um, Bangladesh where she went to go see a local clinic. So you can see that they might have less resources, so things like an ELISA might be not very practical to use there. Um, so rapid, easy-to-use diagnostics have great impacts in these environments. Um, again, you see the picture of the ELISA, has the well play a lot of different reagents, takes more time, and requires a trained per person to operate. Um, so another device form that we develop are called rapid tests. Um, so here you have your entire test is basically on this one little chip, and you have one or two little solutions that the user just adds at a given time. And then 15 to 20 minutes later, you get a result of positive or negative. So very easy to use and very easy to read. Um, and so the way that these actually work is by capillary action. Um, so in case you guys don't know, capillary action is actually what you see when you have a paper towel just wiping up a spill. Um, what happens is the water gets sucked up into small pores or little tubes um, against gravity. So it doesn't require any electricity, any pumps. It just happens naturally. And though this seems like a really simple phenomenon, it's very well understood. So things like what fluid you have or what your material might be all have big effects on, what, on how this behaves. Um, so these are all things we can play with when developing our tests. Um, and because you can get things like fast flow, that means you can get rapid results. It requires no equipment or electricity. It can be used with small volumes, so you can use it with patient samples like small blood drops or finger pricks. Um, and if you can use things like paper to build these, it becomes very affordable. Um, so if we go back to our ELISA um, protocol, we see that it can be simplified by exploiting capillary pressure. So here we can combine almost all of these steps onto a simple, simple strip. So this would all be a paper strip. Um, you have a few different materials. Your sample pad here is where you would be adding your like, blood sample or urine sample, whatever you're testing. Um, your conjugate, conjugate pad would have a labeled um, molecule and you would have a nitrocellulose membrane where you have your test line that's going to come up as positive or negative. Um, so you have three different things that you're mainly using. You have your target, so if we have an antigen, we're just going to look at that as a little ball. Um, that would be in your sample if you're sick or it wouldn't be there if you're not sick. Um, you have your conjugate, which is usually a particle that can be visually seen. So for example, a gold nanoparticle shows up as pink if it's stuck somewhere. Um, and you usually have antibodies attached to that that are specific to your target. So that way they'll bind your target if it's there. Um, and finally, we have our test line on our membrane and that will be an antibody that's also specific to your target antigen. And so it can also bind. And so the way these work is you would add your sample to your sample pad then add a buffer, 
and then it'll travel through the membrane just by capillary action alone. Um, so you have your antigen, it moves through and will interact with your conjugate and then it can bind if there is sample. The membrane will see the capture line and then it can interact with that capture line as well. And so what happens if you have this whole sequence of events occurring, you'll see a red line. So red means you're sick. If you don't see a red line, it means you're healthy. And so again, very easy to operate and under understand. Um, however, even though this is a very simple test format, there actually requires a great deal of understanding to develop these systems so they are actually sensitive enough. Um, you have to look at things like antibody antigen interactions. Um, in the previous slide I showed, this is just a simple ball and little lines. Um, but in reality, they look more like this, where you have all these different interactions that are important. Um, and to understand how well these molecules will interact together, you have to look at things like how they bind, how, how much they like each other, how quickly they bind to each other, because all of that has a huge impact on how sensitive your device is. Um, additionally, because we're using a lot of different materials in our device, you can actually have a big impact on device behavior based on how you overlap these materials or what materials you choose. Um, so this is an image from my thesis work at UW where you can actually model these devices as electrical circuits and you can make it into something that's a little bit more well understood. So you can use things like voltage, current, and resistance, which are very um, well quantified and apply it to these fluidic systems that are a little bit harder to um, describe. So our next question is, how can we take these technologies, ELISA, rapid tests, and improve it? So how can we build on them while still maintaining, maintaining its accessibility? Because um, we don't want to build on it in a way that means it can't be actually used in the settings we're aiming to um, deliver to. So some examples of things we might want to try are signal amplification, multiplexing, telemedicine, and quantification. Um, for example, we could try different um, detection systems. So here we have quantum dots and fluorescence. And those could be useful for improving sensitivity and also because you can have different colors or different systems, you can potentially be able to read different things on a test, so multiplexing. Um, additionally, we can potentially do signal amplification. Um, for example, if we have our small gold particle that we normally have, if we add this simple gold enhancement solution, we can cause the particle to grow bigger in size and improve sensitivity. Um, so examples of how this can actually be done can be seen um, through some work that was actually done at UW. Um, this was done at the Jaeger Lutz Fu Group in the Department of Bioengineering, which is where I did my research. And the way this lab makes their paper-based devices is they actually use a laser cutter to cut different shapes of paper. So here you see devices that have three little legs. Um, and as a result, you can get multiple delivery steps. Um, so in this very top corner, it's kind of light, but you see this very faint pink spot. And that's the signal you get from gold conjugation alone. So what I had in the previous image of a lateral flow test. Um, however, if you include a gold enhancement solution here that flows through, you get the signal to become much darker, which means more sensitive. Um, and then here we have an example of um, incre increasing the number of delivery steps to a large degree, um, kind of pushing the boundary here. Um, so you can do things like enzyme labeling um, and things that are more ELISA-based that give it inherently more sensitivity. Um, also, multiplexing is an option that we're interested in pursuing in the future, um, and this would be useful for a staging of diseases and also it, um, implementing more directed treatments to patients. Um, so here was back to the image of virus um, or the dengue cycle, and you see that antibody shows up at one part, um, anti antigens show up at another part. So at a given time of when you're sick, you're gonna see different things in the patient's blood. So if you're only looking for one species, you might miss whether they're sick or not. Um, so an example of how we can improve on that is having a test that can test for multiple different species. So now you're seeing if they're sick at the very beginning or at the very end and how long they may have been sick. Um, additionally, in a lot of different settings, the treatment is based on your symptoms alone. So with a lot of diseases, these symptoms overlap a lot. So you have fatigue, mild fever, aches and pains. If you go to the doctor, you're not really going to be able to figure out what you're sick with. Um, and so if you had a test that kind of combines diseases that have similar symptoms, you might be able to get more targeted treatment and see exactly what you're sick with and what the best way is for you to get healthy again. 
Right, and I just wanted to mention a, a couple of things on the telemedicine side of things and uh, how we can proceed. And, and we're actually quite excited about um, a collaboration that we're doing with a company called FIO, where we have a situation where we can actually try to quantify our rapid tests and see is this person actually positive or negative without resulting to the interpretation of the end user. So this simple device is really just a cell phone camera put into a little box. And that camera, uh, you run your test, you put it in this little box, and that camera itself has the software that actually allows you to do that data capture and then analyze the results. Is this person actually positive or negative for the disease? Uh, additionally, we can then send these results to you know, a cloud where maybe the doctor can have access to this or maybe the, some other services in a different country, they can actually re see these results, see the actual image itself, and then confirm, yes, this is positive, negative, was there a problem with this assay or not? So that's a very exciting uh, next step, I think, that we can use for actually quantifying uh, how we can actually run these rapid tests. And that's still practical for the end user in a limited resource setting because these are all battery operated. You don't necessarily need to have access to the internet. You can just run these and still have interpretation positive or negative, which is, uh, I think, uh, quite an exciting step for us. Um, other things that we're doing right now currently are um, 3D printing. That additionally, so as, uh, just as Shivani was saying, we're interested in doing multiplexing. So to multiplex what we're actually doing, we need to have different cassettes. That means the plastic housing that's actually holding our rapid tests, we need to be able to test this out and get new models in right away. So right now I'm making 3D designs, I'm printing these off for, so here's, here's your idea for the cassette, and I'm printing off, this is something we just printed off you know, last week just trying to figure out different designs for how we can do our multiplexing. This is very critical because right now, if you're going back and forth with a normal supplier, you're talking months delay instead of you know two hours for a design to actually print it off. So it's been an exciting uh, new addition for, uh, for what we're doing. Um, and just the last thing I wanted to mention briefly, and this applies to both ELISAs and RAPIDs, and it's something that may not be so obvious, I think, to, um, to younger students, are the reagents and the, the criticality of how good your reagents are. Um, and right now, how do people typically currently screen? They typically develop their reagents, their antibodies um, with ELISAs. The recent innovations we've been using in-house and what we'd like to use, um, for instance, right now this is a sample of a microarray that um, I've run for screening our, our antibodies. So we want to be able to screen hundreds of antibodies that we've developed in-house. We need to find the ones that are actually picking up real serum samples. We've had situations where you can develop a recombinant antigen. I know that may be, um, some of you may not know what that is, but you can have a situation where you can have a great antibody with a high affinity to the absolute wrong target. Being able to develop a microarray where you can use a limited serum sample from a very, very precious sample using, say, five microliters of sample and t test your hundreds of antibodies and screen them for the ones that are really reacting with disease that's present in real serum samples has been absolutely critical for us. And if we want to take this a step further, um, we can go to affinity-based screening. So not only is it reactive with our, our current antigen, is it reactive with what's actually in Sarah, but is this actually a high affinity antibody? So those, those uh, equations that Shivani was showing just briefly on where it had an on and off rate, these are actually really critical for having a high quality reagent. So existing technology like surface plasma resonance um, that's been around for 10 or 15 years. Um, the other way we can move, move forward, this is uh, work I also did in graduate school, is array-based affinity screening. So things where you're looking at uh, your antibodies label-free in real time and you can get kinetic information for all the reagents as you're adding them on side by side. And then you can actually get those on and off rates for hundreds of samples, again, with limited volume, which is what we really, really need for getting the affinity information and the actual real serum information. So that's uh, an another exciting innovation that we'd like to move forward to. Uh, and I know with uh, a lot of these uh, bright kids here, it's going to be uh, coming up more. So. Uh, just to uh, conclude, I know there's a lot of survey information in here, so if you have any specific questions, just uh, please let us know. Um, but our goal really as a company is to expand access to diagnostics throughout the world. And we really are targeting a lot of these third world diseases, which makes it a very interesting and fun challenge. Now the technologies that, are, that we're using, these ELISAs, these rapid tests, these have been around for 30 years. These are not anything brand, brand new. But how do you push these systems? How do you make these something that they are sensitive enough where you're getting your 100% sensitivity? How do you push it to the end user where they can use it in China or you know, Istanbul without any issues? Um, you want to be, have, um, so really there are lots of opportunities for exciting innovation and growth. Um, so and really we do feel that through this innovation there is the potential to transform healthcare in these low resource settings, both between even quantitative results with our rapid tests and everything else we've been talking about between the even quantitative results with our rapid tests and everything else we've been talking about. 
So uh, I just want to say thank you very much again once for having us. If you have any questions, please. Yeah. So thankfully, um, our, chief scientific, our chief scientific officer is actually from India, and he has lots of contacts, so it makes it really nice to actually get critical samples that you need to diagnose. Because uh, you, know, you saw those little curves where we showed, here's NS1 an antigen, then an antibody. That's really critical. The, the time someone comes in, if they're coming into the, the hospital on day one of their fever, or day five of their fever, their response is completely different. And you need to be able to know that. So. So you ask a very difficult question, in all honesty. Um, so it depends. So I'll give you that example, the same thing with Dengue. So with Dengue, there are four serotypes, Dengue 1, 2, 3, 4. So if someone who comes in is their primary infection, the first time they're infected, they're going to have that typical response where they may have NS1 show up the first you know, four to seven days. After that, your IgM might come up within, say, five to seven days after infection, then IgG. If it's a secondary infection, because you know, if you get infected with Dengue 1, it does not protect you from Dengue 2, your response can be completely different. Your IgG levels will skyrocket and no IgM levels. So the clinician does not know, has this person ever previously been infected with a different serotype of Dengue? So that really makes it critical to be able to quickly screen for all different things we're looking for, IgG, IgM, NS1, and perhaps even uh, using PCR. If you have a lot of samples, you could, um, in an ideal situation, I, I completely agree. Um, the practical situation we come across is the limited data we get from clinicians. Sometimes you don't know the day's post onset of symptoms. We have had several issues like this. Um, and there's the variability in biological response. So, you know, myself, how I respond from day three, or self response responding to day three, we, we know different people, we actually have different responses, so it makes it uh, difficult to make it absolutely 100%. So, it really, you know, we, we end up having screen with everything, unfortunately. There are a lot of studies going on with this one that uh, mm -hmm. the customer is very simple for a particular game structure for a program and people get it. So, I'm going to convert it to the same direction. Yeah. So, what is the data and the analysis and which medicine uh, applies to us? So uh, uh, perhaps I didn't explain myself very well. So actually, the software for analyzing the actual test is within the phone itself. So that's uploaded to the phone itself. And then the anal analysis happens right there. If you want to, you can upload it into the cloud and let that information be shared with the clinician or uh, whatever doctor that is. Yeah? Do you use protein strips to analyze the data? That's, that's a very interesting idea. Um, there's, um, so there might be something you could do like with tissue culture, if you're culturing um, the virus, that might be something you could, you could actually um, create. It might be more difficult dealing with um, a human being because you don't know in what cell is that virus residing, and then do you have access to that cell to begin with. So there's some, some difficulties in that part. Uh, just to add on to that, that's actually a lot of how different reagents are developed. They'll take, especially in like tissue culture, um, protein engineering labs, they'll infect cells that they can control with virus and see what the virus produces. 
and they can look at your antigen and your antibody and use that to see how you can improve their binding together and you can look at their